Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, we're so delighted to speak to you today and to hear your stories. Um, it's my uh, pleasure to start the first of what would be many conversations just like this led by our president. It's also my honor today to have the opportunity to introduce uh, President Biden uh, to you. Uh, he's put investing in America at the forefront of his administration since day one. Uh, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to our president, Joe Biden. Well, thank you, Mayor, for that introduction and a special thanks to all of you for joining us. Mayor Woodfin, Chairman Flores, Cecilia, as well as Jackie, uh, it's good to have you all. You've all been incredible partners in the progress we made together, which, uh, quite frankly, is why we're meeting today. <clears throat> Four years ago, when I came to office, the pandemic was raging and our economy was reeling. Four years later, we still have more to do, but we had one of the most extraordinary periods of progress ever in the history of this country. COVID no longer controls our lives. We've gone from economic crisis to the strongest economy in the world, literally. A record 16 million new jobs, record small business growth, record stock market, record high 401ks, wages are up, inflation is down, way down and continuing to come down. And the smallest racial wealth gap in 20 years. I signed historic laws, modernizing our infrastructure, bringing new chip factories back to the United States. We invented those chips. Lowering prescription drug prices and lowering them significantly. Fighting the climate crisis and gun violence, so much more. But the bottom line is thousands of cities and towns all across America are seeing the great American comeback story, whether they're in red states or blue. All is part of what we're calling an invest in America agenda. It's about seeking my commitment Speaking to the commitment I made as president to be president for all Americans, whether you voted for me or not, whether you're in a red state or a blue state. And that's what being highlighted. We're doing that today to highlight and show where we're just, get, we're just getting started. In the weeks ahead, I'll talk with Americans all across the country about the progress we're seeing in their communities. Roads and bridges being built, lead pipes being removed from homes and schools, seniors saving significant money on prescription drug prices. And through the Investing in America agenda, we planted the seeds for a better future, and now those seeds are finally beginning to sprout. As a result, we're on the cusp of incredible progress and prosperity for the decade to come. That's why we're going to talk what we're going to talk about today. The story is about people whose lives are better in the future that we can be proud of. We're proving, once again, what I've always believed. We're the only nation in the world that's come out of every crisis we faced stronger than when we entered that crisis. We just have to remember who we are. We're the United States of America. And nothing's beyond our capacity when we do it together. So I'm gonna stop there and I'm gonna turn it over to Mayor Benjamin, who I just saw recently, by the way, to get the conversation going. And by the way, Mr. Mayor, congratulations to that beautiful young child of yours. That's really, you're, 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 you're a lucky man. You tell me she's is she already a supporter? She's a supporter, sir. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> President. Well, God love you. And but really, God love your wife. <laughs> yes, sir. So, at any rate, fire away. Go ahead, Randall. Um, Mayor Whiffin, go ahead. Uh, why don't you share with us your Birmingham story? Well, listen, first, let would say we're very, very thankful to you, Mr. President, and, the, and your entire administration, which has allowed us as a city and a government to truly focus on putting people first. You know, over the last four years, as you stated, um, there has been an upswing. For us, wages, income, and employment have been on the rise in Birmingham. The average income has increased by more than 10,000, and we've exceeded pre-pandemic employment by over 17,000 jobs. So Birmingham is seeing job creation. We're seeing growth in innovative industries and opportunity. And I can say without a doubt, that that is directly related to the Biden administration for your investments and support. We're also tracking along national trends as it relates to small business growth and expansion. We have even created an office of business diversity and opportunity um, to be intentionally focused on minority and women owned businesses. And so again, thank you to your administration. Our opera investment has stood up a COVID relief a giveable loan program where literally nine out of every 10 recipients was either a black or woman owned business. And so again, driving what your administration has allowed us to accomplish 
designated city of Birmingham being allowed to be designated as a tech hub has strengthened our recruitment efforts related to enhancing our innovation economy. A couple other notes I want to make. One is that as part of your administration's good job challenge, we are training and placing up to 1,000 residents in healthcare careers. In addition to that, as the state of Alabama is the epicenter of the automotive industry, we're seeing a boost because of your Inflation Reduction Act. And because of those same investments in electric and batteries, in 2023, Alabama became the number one exporter of motor vehicles in the U.S., which we ship more than 11 billion in automotive, automotive bills. These investments, Mr. President, helped us train workers right here in the city limits of Birmingham for more advanced manufacturing jobs. So it doesn't matter through small businesses, clean energy, advanced manufacturing, and healthcare. Our residents see more and more that they don't have to leave their hometown, their city limits to get a good job because they can get one right here. And for us in closing, that really means that the people of Birmingham were excited, excited for a brighter future, excited to see themselves in it, their families, and for us, a great city. So we truly thank you. Well, Mayor, tell me, uh, you know, up in uh, North Birmingham, which is, I think, primarily a minority community, what are you doing up there to revitalize things? So North Birmingham, first of all, it's, it's kind of personal to me. I actually spent my first 11 years of life living in North Birmingham and went to North Birmingham Elementary. But this area has been historically disadvantaged. It is 100% minority um, black. Um, we're talking about low, low employment, as well as few re resources for its residents. And so we um, were so excited to receive <coughs> a $20 million grant um, as part of the Distress Area Recompete Pilot Program for this area. And so in this North Birmingham footprint, it is going to allow us to catalyze economic growth. Um, we call it Reinvest Birmingham. This initiative, a little bit more detail, will allow us to rebuild um, something that's so important to all communities, our North Birmingham Library. And at this actual place, it affords us to create opportunity for learning and careers, as well as seeing a new workforce training site connected to this library for invest investments in entrepreneurship. And my favorite part, because it's part of the national conversation, is a child care facility. All Look, right. So that's it, Mr. President. It's a, it's a game changer for us. Well, I'll tell you what, I can see Frederick Douglass' book behind you. He's, he's proud of you right now in your library. <laughs> Look, yes, uh, yes, boss. Sir. Sure, sure. Thank, thank you so much, Mayor Whitfin, uh, for your leadership. Now I have a chance to call on uh, Ms. Jackie Trapp from Muskego, Wisconsin, uh, to share her story with the president. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Mr. President. I'm Jackie Trapp, a former social studies teacher turned family caregiver. And in 2015, I was diagnosed with an incurable cancer, multiple myeloma. Both the cancer and the chemotherapy caused blood clots, heart attacks, and strokes. So I'll likely be on the critical blood thinner Xarelto for the rest of my life. The new negotiated price of Xarelto because of the Inflation Reduction Act is a tremendous win for countless patients like me who rely on this previously cost prohibitive medication to live. Prior to the Inflation Reduction Act, my out of pocket drug cost ranged from fifteen to over twenty one thousand dollars a year every year for nine years. My energy to fight my cancer was diverted to finding ways to fund my prescriptions. It became my latest occupation, really. Wow. <laughs> Excuse me. But on New Year's Day, when everybody was ringing in the New Year, I actually celebrated my first fill of prescriptions, knowing that the thirty three hundred dollars I paid was going to be my total for the year. In 2025, that cap drops to $2,000, and I won't have to come up with tens of thousands of dollars every year anymore for my medication. Before the Inflation Reduction Act, my husband and I used our savings. I navigated grants, took out home loans, we sold vehicles, and we sold furnishings, and cut out all but the essentials just to meet my co-pays. Ordinary things like dinner out, catching a movie, or exchanging gifts had pretty much ceased. And I thought, 
No one would ever take on Big Pharma as they held patients like me hostage with monopolies over my essential drugs. So I cannot overstate my gratitude for this law, especially to you, President Biden. Thank you so, so much for looking out for patients like me. I have one important question. What's your dog's name? <laughs> my dog is Jake. Jake. <laughs> well, I tell Jake you what. The dog. Look, you know, I want people to understand that uh, I've been uh, having this run in with uh, Big Pharma for a long time. We finally beat them. And the Zarelto you're taking, we're taking it used to cost $517. It's now $197 for people on Medicare. And the idea that you were paying as much, I mean, the Inflation Reduction Act, $2,000 out of pocket annual cap for Medicare prescription drugs. And it's, it's, it's got to be a life changer. You know, the mental impact of having to figure, if I don't take these drugs, my life is literally at stake. And having to figure out how in God's name how in God's name can we get the money to do it? I'm so proud of you. Presumptuous of me to say that. I've never met you personally, but I really am. I'm proud Thank of hell of you. You're just a real fighter, and you look great. I hope, it's, I hope you feel as good as you look. Well, I am so grateful. I can't even overstate that, really. Thank you. This opportunity to thank you means quite a bit to me. Well, all of you got to come to the I'm not going to be in the White House much longer, but you got to come and see me. I want to see you all. <laughs> uh, well, 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 Mr. We'll Mayor. Get, we'll, get, we'll, we'll figure that out, boss. We'll figure that out. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your courage, Ms. Trapp, and, and you keep on fighting. Uh, now you. I have the honor of, uh, of calling on uh, Chairwoman Amelia, Amelia Flores um, uh, to share her story. Uh, uh, Madam Chair. Good to come do, Mr. President. It's an honor to be here with you today. My name is Amelia Flores, and I'm the chairwoman of the Colorado River Indian Tribes, also known as CRIT. And I'm very proud to be the first woman elected to lead our tribe. We broke the glass ceiling on December 5th, 2020. And I've seen firsthand how poor infrastructure, be it water, schools, broadband, our roads, has impacted my tribe. For an example, during my first few months on the job, our tribal utility director came to me with some bad news. Uh, we, didn't, we needed a new well, and I knew our tribal budget was already taxed to the breaking point. And there was no way we could have pulled this off until you passed the ARPA and bipartisan infrastructure law. ARPA helped us fix the broken well and BIL provided more than $7 million to build new wells and improve our distribution system. Phase one is completed. The well is once again serving 1,850 homes and businesses. And when we complete phase two, the new well and distribution system will be able to deliver safe and reliable water to more than 1,000 additional homes, and businesses in our community. This project will allow us to address the housing shortage on our reservation. That means more families can live together on our tribal land. It helps our businesses and our economy grow. Together, that strengthens our culture and most importantly, our sovereignty. The well and water treatment plant will have a long-term impact in our community. And I am grateful for your leadership in making that all happen, Mr. President. Well, I'm grateful to you. And by the way, I learned a long time ago from a friend of mine from Hawaii, a senior senator, <clears throat> when I got elected as a 30-year-old kid to the Senate, he said, Joe, it's Indian nations, Indian nations. And that's exactly how you're handling it. That's how it's treated. And the sovereignty is real. And you need to help. You need to help. And, uh, and uh, let me ask you a question, Chairwoman. Uh, sure. How are these investments how helping your community see a brighter com future for themselves and their families? Is there anything just beyond the water? Is, is, is it the mere fact that the water's there? That's why everybody's excited? Or it's that you're able to begin to fashion your own destiny a little bit. 
Well, thank you, Mr. President, for that question. And certainly, with the um, monies that had come from ARPA and, and the bipartisan um, law, uh, it allows for more people to um, return back to the reservation because many of our uh, tribal members leave the reservation to find work. And when they leave, they oftentimes, oftentimes take their families with them. Um, and then eventually 20, 30 years after, they want to come back home. And that's hard because we don't have the housing or the infrastructure for them to come back. And we haven't been able to do that for them. So with this project, with the new wells and upcoming water treatment system, we will have cleaner and safer water. We now have the infrastructure we need to build for housing for our people. And we can build up our community. We'll have more families here. And that really changes things up for us and gives us hope. And yes, we're the tribes with the water. We have senior water rights on the lower uh, Colorado River Basin. And um, we have the largest water right. Thank you. I know you do. And, and it's about time everybody recognized it. And we just had a photograph up on the other board here while you were talking about how beautiful the countryside is. It's a magnificent area. Mm -hmm. So thank you, and you're doing a great job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, now it's our honor. We have um, Ms. Cecilia Moyep uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, here to share her story. Uh, please, Ms. Um, Moyep, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Cecilia Moyep. Uh, in 1966, I was a widow with three small children living in Chinatown, Philadelphia. I was at a public meeting when I found out that the church and school my children went to was going to be demolished for a federal highway program. The church was the heart and lifeblood of the community, so I got involved. I formed a grassroots organization to uh, fight against the highway. We organized, we picketed, we protested, but we did have some success because we were successful in protecting the school and the church from being demolished. But despite our efforts, the Vine Street Expressway was still built through the heart of Chinatown. And even over the years, many of my neighbors and I were forced out of our houses because of other transportation projects. The Vine Street Expressway created a physical divide that made Chinatown less safe. It made our air quality worse, the construction, displaced so many people from our community. But from the very beginning, we tried to get the highway capped to improve safety and to reconnect Chinatown, but there was never funding to make it happen. But now, after 50 years of organizing, thanks to you and your administration or, uh, for their investment in the Chinatown Stitch Project, this dream will finally become a reality. Our community has been asking for this for decades, and it would never have happened without your funding. Thank you so much for delivering, Mr. President, for our community. Cecilia, I know your community pretty well. I live down the road in Delaware, and I-95 <laughs> went through my community, and, and it, it, uh, not where I live, but in, in west, the western part of the city, and it divided mm -hmm. entire communities. It's four lanes across. <laughs> And we've been fighting for a long time. We finally got commitments. We got the money. For example, you're going to get, you're going to share on how $159 million, $159 million from the Inflation Reduction Act uh, and the, uh, the China Stitch Project is going to reconnect huh? Philadelphia Chinatown, which was divided in construction back in the 60s with the Vine, the Vine Street Expressway. That project will cover 2.5 blocks of expressway with public green space, achieving the goal you've been fighting for for nearly 60 years. I know you're only 62 years old, but you've been fighting a long I time. I wish. <laughs> <laughs> the Department of Transportation experts have signed a grant agreement in January. The project's going to take a while to get done, 
but it will, we expect it to begin full, born, full blown in 2028 and be completed by in early 31. So it's going to take a little time, but it's going to be completed. It's going to be done. The money is there. And uh, I'm still alive to see it. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be alive. You'll be but God it's something, you. yeah, it's something the community has wanted for a long, long time. And this will give our community, families and children, the peace of mind knowing that people can be safe going to school and to work. It means a lot to know that the federal government listened to us and is helping us to build a brighter future for families right here in Chinatown. Well, Thank you, Mr. President. All over the country we're doing this. And by the way, there's a photograph of you with a shovel in your hand up on the board here <laughs> and a hard hat on celebrating the turn of the spade to this getting going. Now, what I don't want you to do, I don't, I don't want you working beyond 5 o'clock at night, though, okay? You got to promise me you'll be home. <laughs> that's hard because when you're doing community work, it's always at night. <laughs> I, that's true. God love you. Cecilia, I'm so, so, so proud of you. I thank really you. am so proud of you. Presumptuous me to say that, but I am. Well, thank you all very much. This just all the families deserve to have things that we share today. Not just, not just the four in our community. Peace of mind. Having clean and safe water. Affordable medicine. Stay healthy. Safe roads and bridges to connect communities rather than divide them. And so much more. All Americans deserve a future worthy of their dreams. And that future we're building today, and we're doing it, and we're able to afford to do it. Turning setbacks into comebacks, that's what America does. And I want to thank you for what you're doing. And I'm excited, excited about sharing your investment stories with all of America. Seeing more of them in the weeks and months ahead. To let people know we can do anything in America. We really can, and we can afford to do it. Instead of giving billion dollar tax, trillion dollar tax cuts to the super wealthy, let them start paying their fair share. Let them make sure we get, make, look, all people want in America is just a shot, just a chance, just to be treated fairly and equally. And that's what you all are doing. That's what you're all part of. And I hope I get to see you all in person one of these days. So thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you all. Thank you. May God protect our troops. <laughs>